Here we go. Here we go. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts, and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all, it's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. We come to Exodus, the 14th chapter. Actually, we're going to start with verse thir chapter 13, verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham at the, on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night, in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near pi Heroth, between Brichton and the sea. <laughs> they are to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal Millville. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around in the land, the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with the officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them and camped by the sea near Pi Binlin, opposite of Baal Millville. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, what is it, what was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. 
Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today will never, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry land. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God who had been traveling in front of, the Israel, of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in, from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that, uh, all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on the dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving, and the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on the left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hand, hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and, Mo and in Moses, his servant. May the Lord bless this reading of his holy scriptures. Today's message is entitled, Fearless. As I went throughout this week, I had many opportunities to be afraid and many opportunities that I was afraid. Now, fear manifests itself differently in our lives. Fear can be absolute terror. It can be anxiety. It can feel, be a feeling of dread. In fact, probably tonight, about 8 o'clock, I might begin having that feeling of dread about Monday morning. Anybody get the Monday morning dreads, all right? We get these feelings of worry, anxiety, they're all related to fear. And so what I wanted to talk about today is not the idea that we're supposed to somehow get rid of fear, because fear is always going to be in our lives, but that we have the ability to overcome that fear and not to allow that fear to dictate our behavior. Because Really, fear allows, dictates most of our behavior. Anxiety will dictate our behavior. Depression, sadness, all these things end up dictating our behavior. And what is the one thing that should be directing our behavior? It is our faith in God. We see in this story with the Israelites, let me give you the little background. The Israelites have been in bondage with the Egyptians. They were enslaved to the Egyptians. They cried out to God to be delivered from the Egyptians. Now you don't see that within this passage, but you see it in the preceding passages that they cried out to God for a deliverer. And God sent them Moses. And these Egyptians got to see the mighty hand of God move through the plagues that eventually got Pharaoh to let them go. God worked on behalf of the people. He answered their prayer. He sends them Moses. Now, when they exit out of Egypt on their way to the promised land, we see several things within this passage. One, God doesn't take them through the shortcut. He takes them the long way. In fact, we know that eventually that it, it's an 11-day journey and it takes the Israelites at the end of the day 40 years. 
40 years because the Israelites had to learn something about God. Every time they saw a mighty movement of God, it says, and they feared the Lord and they trusted the Lord. And then one chapter later, they're back to worrying. They're back to being afraid. They're back to wanting to go back to Egypt because after all, it was so much better back then. How many of us look at the past through, the, through rose colored glasses, right? Every generation goes, well, boy, those were the days. Those were the good old days. Well, you know what? When it was the good old days, they were looking back on other days going, the good old days. We, look, we tend to look at the past through rose-colored glasses, and we tend to look at the present through the lens of a microscope, and we look at the future through binoculars that are backwards, that it seems so far off. But we never have true clarity of thought. We never have that true vision. And we allow all these things to overtake our, our minds and our thinking. And so the Israelites, they become afraid. So God takes them around the longer way and ends up camping them between the Israelite army or the Egyptian army and the Red Sea. Now, immediately you would sit there and think, why is God doing that to me? Why is God placing me in a difficult position? Because God is deliberately placing them in a difficult position. But God is placing them in a difficult position, not for their destruction, but for their benefit. We see within the passage, he does it for their benefit. Now, the people immediately, they look at their circumstances. And this is what all of us do. We look at our circumstances and we begin to cry out. The people cry out, and, and how we cry out, it can be a whine, uh, it can be, you know, the, the shoulda, coulda, wouldas, it can be a prayer chain type of thing, and we, we immediately cry out, and we're like, oh, this is it, we're going to die. In fact, throughout the Bible, there's so many times when the Israelites are in a situation and go, this is it, we're going to die, end the story. But God deliberately puts them in this place, and God is deliberately uh, working even through the enemy, the perceived enemy. He's working in Pharaoh's heart and in Pharaoh's mind because he's trying to demonstrate to the Israelites, the people of God, how big, how great, and how good he is. That no matter what they're facing, whether they're in bondage, he will be their deliverer. Whether they are being chased down, he will be their fighter. He will be their refuge. He will be their strength. He's trying to teach them all this stuff. But, it, but they're not thinking about what is God trying to teach me. They're sitting there thinking, this is it. We're going to die. And so they're there between the army and they're there between the Red Sea. And we come to what Moses says to the people. Moses answered to the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord, the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, and I have to tell you, I love this passage, this part right here. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Now, my friends, I got to tell you, I think that that's a message that God has for all of you, all of us. Like, I love when people sit there and they always go, they always want the pastor to pray for them. Like, I have some sort of hotline to God that you don't have access to. You know, pa you know, when you're in the hospital, you want the pastor to come see you. I don't know why. I'm not that good looking, not that special. Uh, and I don't bring gifts most of the time. But you want me there and you want me to pray for you. And, and, deal, and that's a high privilege to be able to do that for each and every one of you. But a lot of times I think this is what God's saying. Why are you crying out. Why, in other words, why are you whining? Why are you depressed? Why are you sad? Tell the people to move on. Recognize that this is not where you're going to stay. Yes, problems are going to come for a time. Weeping remains for a night, but joy comes in the morning. That's what God is saying. He's saying, tell these people, this is not going to be it. Move on. But Moses has to remind the people, do not be afraid. 
Now, it's been said, I have never counted it myself, that there are 365 times in the Bible that there is some reference to do not be afraid. One for every day of the year, actually. And it's also interesting to me in the Bible that the people are afraid when God, when they perceive that God isn't there, but they're also afraid when God is there. Every time God shows up, he always has to start off with, don't be afraid. Yes, it's really me. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm not here to destroy you. Good things are coming. But the people always are afraid. Have you recognized in our lives that we tend to go on these cycles of fear all the time? There, how many of us dealt with fear of something just today? And remember, fear can be anxiety, worry, all those things. Raise your hand. Go ahead. Raise your hand. If not, I'm going to give you something to be afraid of. Remember when your parents used to say to you, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about? That never made sense to me. I'm already an emotional wreck and now you're scaring me because I don't know what's coming. So we all deal, deal with this fear and we deal with it all the time. So every time, so, in, so fear isn't going to go away. Obstacles are not going to go away. In fact, they're going to come at us even more so. Because again, God is always wanting to demonstrate his glory. And he demonstrates his glory by taking impossible things and doing, doing possible things through them. He does the impossible all the time. Even when we sit there and go, oh, this is going to be it. That's where we end up getting our attention on God and where he gets that glory. But we do have to get ourselves off of this cycle of going, and this is it. I'm going to die. This is going, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been by people's bedsides. Some of you are in the congregation now who have told me you are going to die. And I have a word for you. Yes, you are. One day we all are going to die. But here you are. So where does the problem with fear come into play? The problem of fear comes into play because it's really an issue of trust. When fear comes up, we have to address it with our trust in God. And at the end of the day, we become fearful because we also forget what God has done for us yesterday. We forget all the things that you were... Can you remember what you were worried about a year ago from now, a year ago today? Can you remember what you were worried about a month ago? Maybe a week ago? You see, all those things end up sucking our life, sucking our time, and yet God has moved on. We have moved on. And so what we have to recognize is that we are not made to live in fear. In fact, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. When we operate in a spirit of fear, therefore we are not, we're operating in a position of weakness and in a position of confusion. And that's when we end up doing bad, stupid stuff. And that's why it's important not to be afraid. Yesterday, I watched one of the Halloween movies. And the thing is that when I watch these movies, I've seen these movies, you know, the Michael Myers thing. And I get nervous every time I watch them. And I get nervous, I think, because I go, what is wrong with these stupid people? Why do they run upstairs when they should be running out the door? Why don't they call the police? Why aren't they running to somebody's neighbor's home and said they're hiding in a closet? Are you kidding me? If you've seen every mo any movie, you know that they're going to look in the closet or hiding in the shower. I go, you idiot. And I actually say this stuff out loud. But you know what happens is when you're operating in a spirit of fear as they are, you do stupid things. And so we actually have to get ourselves out of this pattern of behavior and start operating in a spirit of trust and confidence in God. So it really all comes down to this, trusting in our Heavenly Father's love, recognizing His love, His protection, His provision, and that He's never let us down. Has God really ever let you down? If you think about it, no, He hasn't. He may not, I think it was Karen who said during Sunday school when I made them say they're, what they're thankful for, she said, God doesn't give me, God has given me everything that I need. It may not be everything that I want, but he has given me everything that I need. And that's what Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 27. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? 
Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? So in other words, all we have to do is look at creation, look at nature all around us. And in fact, the Bible tells us that that is one of the ways in which we get a revelation of God is all of creation cries out to God. All of, ref all of nature reflects His glory and that He takes care of all of them and He has taken care of us. And why do we allow that worry to consume our life? The worry doesn't actually change anything, does it? No matter how much we talk about a situation, does it change it? No matter how much we think about a situation, does it change it? One of the things that I have found helpful in my life is asking myself whether or not I have the power to do anything in any particular situation. If I have the power to do something and the ability to do something, then perhaps I should go ahead and do that thing that I need to do, right? You know, if I need money, then maybe I need to say, do I have the power and ability to get a job? Then let me get a job. And then let me trust that God's going to provide for my daily bread. So it isn't to say that I don't have a responsibility to do what I need to do, but then I also ask myself, if I don't have, if I don't have the power and ability to do anything about it, then why am I going to continue talking about it or worrying about it? There's all kinds of things happening in the news, happening in the world around us that can just lead you into a feeling of absolute chaos. But again, God hasn't given, God is not a God of confusion. He's not a God of chaos. Rather, He wants us to be strong, firm, and steadfast, immovable. He wants us to recognize what can I do? Do all that I can, and at the end of the day, just stand there. Because actually, that's what it said, Moses said to the people. He said, Don't be afraid. All you need to do is be still. And in fact, you got to be still, and sometimes we just got to be silent. Because we use, you can use our, we can use our words to build up our faith, but we can also use our words to tear down our faith, can't we? How do we sit there and pray in faith and then complain in the same breath? James says it this way when he talks about blessing and cursing people. How can fresh water and salt water come from the same spigot, basically? How can we actually negate our prayers with our words? We'll say that we have faith, but do our words reflect that faith? Do our actions reflect that faith? The Israelites said that they had faith in God, but did, were they exhibiting that faith? No, they were crying out, they were worrying, and they were already probably plotting out their destruction. So why do we get to trust in God? Well, we know His love for us, and we know that God goes before us. One of the things that we see within this passage is that God was a pillar of fire by day and a pillar of smoke at night. There was a, there was all, or a pillar of fire by night, cloud by day. There we go. There was always the presence of God, and the presence of God was generally always going before the people. Or the presence of God was standing in between the people and their destruction. But the presence of God was there. We need to recognize that God already is in tomorrow and remind ourselves that if he was faithful yesterday and if he's faithful today, will he not be faithful tomorrow? See, faithfulness is an everlasting attribute of our Heavenly Father. He has always been faithful, even when we are faithless. Chris talked about in his testimony the nine the 99 and the 1, that the, fa that the good shepherd leaves the 99 to go after the 1. Even if we wander away, God doesn't give up on us. Amen? Amen. Deuteronomy 31.8, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. I find that this is helpful to start reading first thing in the morning. Because first thing in the morning, I pop up. Now, I am not a joyful person first thing in the morning. I, you know that might, you might find that hard to believe. It takes a little bit of time, a little bit of coffee, and a whole lot of Jesus time before I'm so, uh, able to be social out there. And one of the things that makes it 
so dreadful sometimes in the morning is I think about all the things that I have to do today and all the things that are going to come my way. Wouldn't it be better to, than to sit and think about my agenda than to pause and meditate on this passage? The Lord is going before me in my day. The Lord is already in every situation that is going to come my way. And in all those situations, he's there. And as long as God is there, I know I'm good. Whether, it pers whether it's bad times or good times, because sometimes God allows us to go into these pressure cooker situations. But he never leads us into pressure cooker situations for the purpose of our destruction. He always leads us into those pressure cooker situations in order to make us better. Because at the end of the day, we don't mature and grow on our own. We mature and grow as we go through things with God. We actually have faith to go through things, not to go around things. Romans 8.28 says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Important to recognize, it says that all things work together for good, but not all things are good. Cancer is not good. Disease isn't good. These things aren't good. But God works all these things together for an ultimate good, a bigger good. And what it tells us in Jeremiah about the fact that God has a plan for our lives, it says, and he has a plan to bring about good in your final analysis. So many times we give up on God halfway through the journey. We're like the Israelites and we just got out of Egypt and we've already given up. Just when the going gets hard, we check out. And we never give God the opportunity to show up. We never give God the opportunity to do what he has always promised to do. And that is to work it all together for his ultimate glory. The next thing we need to remember is not only that God goes before us, but that God is with us. This is a very important thing. So many times people think that God is against them. Because they've heard that God is against them. Some well-meaning well religious person probably has said it at some point in time. Because you know what? While we talk about the fact that we've all fallen short of the glory of God, we don't act like it. And so somehow we think that those things accumulate and that God is against us. But it doesn't say that within Scripture. It says that God is with us. He never will leave us. Never ever will forsake us. Nothing in all of creation, not even your stupidity, can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not even yourself, your sheer will, you cannot separate. That love is going to pursue you. That's why the writer, one of the writers says that God is the great hound of heaven. He is constantly pursuing us with, uh, with his love. Jesus, this, or excuse me, before I get to that, in Exodus, it says, and the, and the Lord answered, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. So when God is with us, we get the opportunity to be at rest because we get to go, hey, God is God and I'm not. Yesterday, we had the road clean up and I was not in charge. I may be the pastor, I may have the title, but we all knew who was in charge yesterday. And generally, we know who's in charge. Deborah is in charge. But Deborah was in charge. You know what was great? And Deborah had Jimmy with a, with a truck driving back and forth telling us, you know, do we need to put our bags in? All I had to do was be faithful with picking up the trash that was in front of me and deal with the bag in front of me. I didn't have to think about what was going on in front of me. I didn't have to think about the other teams. I had a job to do and I just needed to be faithful in doing it. It is a wonderful thing not to be in charge. And God wants to be in charge of our lives. See, everybody wants to be the boss. Whenever I talk to business students, they all, I go, why are you a business student? And they all want to be a boss. I go, you don't want to be the boss. The boss gets anxiety, gets acid reflux, and has to deal with all of you. You don't want to be the boss. God is the boss. And when God is the boss, and when we recognize that he's the boss, we get to have rest because it's only my job to trust and obey. 
We're not going to sing that song because I don't like that song. But there is no other way to be faithful in Jesus than to trust and obey, as the old hymn goes. If there was a better tune to it, I would sing it, but I hate that tune. All right. But Deuteronomy 31.6 is be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And I think we just got to constantly remind ourselves that God is with us. And now there's a scripture passage that should have been on this slide, but it's on the next one. Because one of the ways that Jesus is defined is that he is Emmanuel, God with us. That's what Jesus translates as. Behold, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. God with us. That's an amazing idea that God is with us no matter where we're at. You don't need to be in church for God to be with you. But God is always with you. And not only is he with us, but he is for us. And that's an important thing to recognize that God isn't out to punish us. There is no fear in love, the Bible says. Perfect love casts out fear. God is not out to punish us. He may discipline us. He may correct us, but he's not out to punishment. So you see, discipline and punishment are two different things, right? Discipline is about correction. A parent corrects their child, but there are people that punish, and they're punitive, and they're hurtful. And that does no good to a child, right? You, we understand the difference between punishment and correction. God may discipline us to correct our behavior because he wants us to be mature and complete and not lacking in any good thing. But he's not out to punish us. Look at what it says in Romans 8, 31 through 32. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Everybody say all. all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? God, look how God demonstrated his love for us. While we were yet enemies and strangers of God, while we didn't want anything to do with him, he sent his son to die for us. And not only that, when the son was on his way to death, when he was hanging on the cross, he was enduring mocking and scorning and shame and all these things, and yet still demonstrates his love for us. So if God didn't give up on us then, if God didn't give up on us and turn away from us then, what makes you think that he's going to do it to you now? But we do. We go, oh, I think this is it. This is going to be the moment that God's going to turn his back on me. This is going to be the moment. I've done too much too long. There's nothing that you can do. You are not that powerful to separate yourself from the love of God. And if God is always on your side. Now, here's the thing. Abraham Lincoln said this. I don't pray that God is on our side. I pray that we're on his. And that's a very important distinction. God is always on your side. But the question is whether or not you are on his side. His side is always for your best. Always for your eternal benefit. And how many times do we want things and we want it and we want it now, but if we had it and we had it now, we know now if we look back that it would have been a bad thing. How many of us can look back on those things that we just so utterly, desperately, we say, oh, I'll, I'll never be happy unless I have this. And now we can look back and go, thank God he didn't give it to us. Or sometimes he does allow us to get it. And then we go, why do I have it? I had that nice Cadillac. And I also had the nice car payment with came with that Cadillac. And I get, went, okay, why did I get that car? But when I test drove that car, oh, it looked good. When I felt the car, it felt good. It had the nice heated seats, the nice heated steering wheel, it looked good. I lusted after that car. <laughs> I bought that car in like two hours. I said, I want it, I gotta have it. And then when that car payment came in, I went, I don't want it. I don't need to have it. And now I don't have it no more. It's gone. But you know what? Also, the money's gone. The money that could have gone to something else. You see, never exchange those short-term things for the long-term benefit. There's a long-term gains that we always exchange for short-term wins. You got to invest 
in your trust in God. Invest in the long haul and recognize that God is leading us. And where does God lead us? He does not lead us into destruction. I love the fact that several times in that Exodus passage, it talked about in the beginning of it and toward, at the end of it, that God led the people through the Red Sea and there was a wall of water on the right and a wall of water on the left. It's very descriptive. It says it two times. Why does it say it two times? Because you've got to recognize how miraculous it is that God led them through it. God leads us through things, not at the end of those things. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians 2, 1 through 16 in the message translation. In the Messiah, in Christ, God leads us from place to place in one perpetual victory parade. I just love that passage, in one perpetual victory parade. Through us, he brings the knowledge of Christ. Everywhere we go, people breathe in the exquisite fragrance because of Christ, we give off a sweet scent rising to God, which is recognized by those on the way of salvation. An aroma redolent with life, but those on the way to destruction treat us more like the stench from a rotting corpse. Mm, that's another message. But this idea that God leads us from place to place in one perpetual victory parade. From one victory to the next victory to the next victory. And every victory may have times that it looks like failure. Every victory has times when it looks like it's not going to work out that way. That's the plot line of almost every movie, right? I mean, somehow the hero wins, but we're always caught up in the movie and we think maybe this is the time that the hero is going to die. This is the time that's going to fail. And then we get to, and they lived happily ever after. Now, life doesn't always end up on this side of eternity as living happily ever after, but we do get this promise that God wins. I read the back of the book and I see that God wins. And if he wins and we're on his side, then we get to win. And recognize that wherever we go, whatever's going on in our lives, wouldn't it be nice not to be whining and complaining, but to be the aroma and fragrance of Christ in this world? So people would see and smell and know something's different in us. I want to end with this passage from Joshua 1. In the same way I was with Moses, I'll be with you. I won't give up on you. I won't leave you. Strength courage. You are going to lead this people to inherit the land that I promised to give their ancestors. Give it everything you have, heart and soul. Make sure you carry it out. The revelation that Moses commanded you, every bit of it. Don't get off track, either the left or the right, so as to make sure you get to where you're going. And don't for a minute let this book of the revelation be out of your mind. Ponder and meditate on it day and night, making sure you practice everything written in it. Then you'll get to where you're going. Then you'll succeed. Haven't I commanded you? Strength, courage. Don't be timid. Don't get discouraged. God, your God, is with you every step you take. May the Lord bless this reading. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message and we thank you for the trust that we get to have in you. We thank you, Father, that you have always, always been faithful in our lives. Help us, Father, not to remember, or help us not to forget. Help us always to remember your love, always to remember your faithfulness, always to rely upon your grace. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. 
church is for wimpy girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay. Really?